these passages are very interesting from Hegel's syllogism because he's reworking Aristotle's syllogism in a way that's directly influencing Marx and that entire tradition. And, um, and it's very difficult. Like for me, it's very difficult because I think it's very, I'm trying to read it very slowly. So we're going to read it together because mm -hmm. three, four, five people reading it together okay. is better than one person, but it's incredibly profound and understudied. People understudy, unless you're Hegel specialist, we understudy Hegel's logic. And mm -hmm. that's absolutely fundamental. Um, and I'm reading an interesting book just to finish this kind of introduction. Uh, it's available in English, but it was very expensive, so I didn't buy it. So I got it in Russian because it was cheaper, but it's a great book. I love that. I got it in Russian because it's cheaper. <laughs> I mean, that's a... um, it's, uh, it's called, it's by Lucien Goldman. It's a Romanian French philosopher who died in 1970. And the book is called Lukács and Heidegger. It's published in 1970. It's an unfinished book. He I died. I can't read that kind of script. <laughs> and um, it makes this interesting argument that Lukács and Heidegger essentially confronted the same question. They right. just had a different vocabulary. Right. Oh, I've read Lukács and I've read Heidegger. Right. And he wrote those, those, those book logos. And so, what so, is this man's name? His name is... Um, well, some people say that, that Heidegger wrote in, I think I, I remember this correctly, that Heidegger wrote in, in kind of response to Lukács. Well, that's his thesis. Okay. There's a conversation oh, between the lines, uh, which the leftists, of course, freaked out. Because right. how can you? But he's saying actually both identified the fundamental critique of positivism mm -hmm. using their own language. Heidegger's was more philosophically pure because right. his audience was philosophical. Right. himself and other, and Lukács' language had to become more kind of mechanistic sounding because it was addressed at a party, at actual politics and like workers and unions and that kind of stuff. So right. his language had to be more the language of like colloquialism. So it sounded kind of less sophisticated to some ears. Mm -hmm. Whereas, but, but essentially they talked about the same or similar problems in different ways, using a different language. Sure. And they started from the same philosophical tradition in Germany. Right. Um, and I think it's and Lucien Goldman with two, N, uh, with two N's, but he was a Romanian philosopher uh, who escaped, you know, the fascist government in Romania, ended up in France, post-war, became like a kind of a well-known figure. He in, died early. In those notes that I gave you there yeah. to give you more work to do, back in, no, in the, in, in the today's right, reading. Yeah. Let me get it out. It, I mentioned I mentioned Merleau Ponty. Have you read Merleau Ponty? Very little. We read. I read very little. Well, unfortunately, he 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 was a French communist, very high class philosopher, and yeah. um, a high high level philosopher. Oh yeah. And he did all of the a lot of the original work in France on phenomenology. Mm -hmm. And in my note, I say, you probably don't have time to read Merleau-Ponty. If you do, I can loan you a couple of books. But otherwise, check the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy right. for the article on Well, Merleau-Ponty was, like all the French, were influenced by Heidegger's being in time, right? Uh, or they were influenced by Lukács. But do you know, you know that most of them had not read Hegel? And when they wrote about Hegel, but they had been influenced by Hegel, but they all heard one guy's lectures, so Koshev. the knowledge of Hegel was mm -hmm. mediated by one by this person by the name of Kozhev, right? Who was a Russian immigrant, who turned out to be a well, secret agent for the Soviets, yeah. but well, in the French yeah. academic scene, you know, <laughs> he called America the origin, the the, the, the American anyway, society. Let's go back to your beautiful article. Well, but the thing that's, that maybe that's a problem with the French compared to the German. The Germans are always much more rigorous. The Germans always are. Much more rigorous in their thinking. So the French like write about Marx, but they don't necessarily read Hegel. The Germans read like Marx and Hegel. You know, Heidegger read Marx. You know, in the letter on humanism, you can tell that he, well, he must have read Lukács because well, that was a kind of a famous book. Class is going to change things. That's no doubt. But the, you know that's certainly changing things. But the German intellectual the, culture the is very rich. The scholarship was yeah. such a different scholarship. Yeah. And this is the American weakness. 
Yeah. We don't have this kind of a tradition. We're much more positivistic. Unfortunately, I mean, we have Dewey, who was a great thinker. Yeah. But who's after Dewey? I mean, Richard Rorty? I consider him to be much less interesting than that. Rit Dahl, uh, 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 Harvard professor, uh, liberal. Oh, the guy, the, the Clash of Civilizations guy. No, not that guy. That guy's not even a philosopher. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, the, you like, uh, he's, he's a big, wrote that big book on... On, um, Do you, uh, you know, the big Harvard philosopher Rawls? Oh, he's, he's like the like, one name after Dwork after uh, well, I thought Dewey. Some of his work was very interesting. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, there's like two figures over a hundred year period, or maybe That's right. three figures. Right. And then in the 19th century, there's a well, great nobody, American. Nobody reads Dewey anymore. Dewey, there's still a Dewey group, but. Did you ever hear anybody mention Dewey right. at CUNY? But Dewey's great. He founded the New School for Social Research. I know that. I mean, he also he also founded that home uh, uh, that uh, that the uh, home. Uh, hey Phil. Hey Phil. Yeah. The, well, in the nineteenth century, he founded a school in Chicago, right. and he always said the test of a philosophy is what it means when it's applied. Right or the influence that it has in actual life. Yeah. Well, there's a great 19th century American philosopher, you know, logician, yeah. who influenced a lot of your uh, Peirce. Yeah. You know, Peirce was well, a great... People love, but yeah. I was, yeah. So in other words, there are like five or six figures, but we could do better. Yeah. <laughs> we could do better. Rawls met his wife because they both like making uh, lists of, uh, what do you call it when you make a... Grocery, a grocery list? of the citations. Oh, uh, um, but bibliographies. No. Bibliography? No, it's not a bibliography. A bibliography, you recite books. Oh, yeah. And this is another, another thing. But he and his wife both like doing that. And they <laughs> met making these lists of names. And that's how, and working in the library, that's how they met. <laughs> I mean. Who loves? Yeah. So. Okay, maybe we can start on page 12, actually, the bottom of page 12, like that would be a good place to just to pick up from last time. Okay. Or the middle of page 12, where he talks about the mind, and he's, he's basically proposed the working definition of like intelligence being not a natural gift, mm -hmm. but rather society's gift to a person. Remember, this also has roots in Aristotle, uh, because the entire Marxist tradition and the entire kind of Hegelian tradition, most Western, not a, but a lot of the classic German philosophy and um, Marxism and thus Ilenkov and that, this kind of Soviet philosophy is rooted ultimately in Aristotle's notion, which comes, which is articulated in the politics of Aristotle, among other places, that, you know, in the politics he says, he asks the question, um, what comes first, the individual or society, or the community? And he says, without a doubt, the community precedes the in individual and is thus higher in importance. Why is that? And he says, well, because, you know, we're, it, I'm just paraphrasing, we're always, we're born into an already existing network of communities. In other words, the moment, the moment a person is born, right, the moment a person is born, we're born into, right? Uh, a, but a very he also says that speech proves man was supposed to live in communities. Right, right. So the Aristotelian notion that the communal determines, or in other language, overdetermines who we are as individuals, uh, is basically right here. When when Yelenkov says that intelligence is basically a function, it's society's gift to a person. So. If you live in a society that is developed in a particular cultural ways, what he calls culture, others might call, it has a particular history or a particular politics, uh, you're going to become that person or not. So uh, uh, if, if uh, in middle of that page 12, right, it is incidentally a gift that he will later repay a hundredfold from the point of view of a developed society. The most profitable of capital investments, quote unquote, right, is exactly what society gives to a person, what we inherit from the society that we're born into. So automatically, if, if I'm born into a society with dysfunctional schooling system, and I attend that schooling system, that's the gift I receive from my society. This sort of shapes my trajectory. That's why it's so important to 
to really think about the fundamental socialization um, aspects of each society, the schooling, the health, what is the dominant ideology, and all these political questions. This is why politics is more important than cybernetics. You know? <laughs> um, okay, unintelligently organized. So here we have an interesting definition of what his political goal is, what he calls a communist society. It's very interesting. This is not Soviet dogma. This is not Soviet dogma of what a communist society is or whatever. So for Ilenko, for kind of an honest Marxist philosopher actually, an intelligently organized society is a communist society, communally grounded society. What does that mean? It's a communist society, a society that can be constituted only by fully developed people. So in other words, the word intelligent, you know, it's another, it's, these are difficult words, right? So an intelligent person, inte intelligent society, which by extension produces intelligent people because the social conditions the individual. What is an intelligent person? What is an intelligent society? Here he's basically expanding on Kant's letter, what is the enlightenment? It has to do with social relationships undertaken by people living socially, communally, that are fully developed. Fully developed, doesn't mean equally developed, but a well-functioning society is a society where each member lives life to their fullest potential, whatever that may be. And there are variations in potentials, of course, but the, the point is not that everybody's gonna be the same, which was the caricature of communist politics, right? Either coming from the left or from liberals or from the right or whatever. The point is, if, if, this, if, if this represents me at, at, uh, at a certain age of immaturity, like childhood, for example, and as I grow up and I become socialized and more fully exposed to the different sort of uh, communities that make up uh, broadly my society, the point is there has, to be, there has to be progression. The progression is not gonna be linear, right? But there has to be a progression until I reach a particular plateau. And then that plateau that maintain itself, who knows, for a period of time. And then there could be a, there could be a regression, you know, whatever. But the point is there has to be a movement that's as substantial as possible on each individual and collective level. Otherwise, you're living in a society where one certain parts of society are artificially underdeveloped. That's difficult to justify for him. So communist politics for Ilenkov is a, is, a, is a society that's organized to, to the extent possible, create a well-functioning society, which is defined by society of well-developed, fully developed uh, uh, social relationships between people. I think that's a very useful thing to know, to think about. Uh, where is this coming from? Well, Kant says that, right, in the letter. Of, it's not a Marxist argument only. Kant says the society that he wants to live in, an enlightened society, right, in the letter, uh, what is enlightenment, that Kant, that Ilenkov is quoting here. Kant says a society that he wants to live in, an enlightened society, a society where adult humans are mature, i.e., they have the ability to live life by making sense of it through their own sense-making apparatus, they're thinking, they're emotional, you know, they, they have the ability to make sense and act upon whatever their, their sense-making apparatus is telling them. So you have the ability to act thoughtfully. The alternative is you act only through somebody else who thinks for you. And Kant says that's a condition of immaturity, childlike behavior, which is un justifiable in adults. That's not a good outcome. So, uh, you can also make the analogy back to Aristotle that, that Ilyankov would probably agree with. Uh, you know, Aristotle makes these analogies of what does it mean to be a well-functioning human what being? What does it mean to be what? Well-functioning, well-developed human being. Fully developed, wholly developed. Aristotle uses the word whole. You know, in Aristotle it's, it's whole to parts, right? Um, and he says, uh, Aristotle says in the politics, among other places, he says, he makes the analogy to the healthy body. 
A healthy human being, a healthy society, a healthy politics is like a healthy body. Every constitutive part of your body or most of the constitutive parts of your body have to be healthy in order for your whole to be healthy. It's like a system. You can almost analyze this positivistically too. Like you have different systems that make up your body, cardiovascular, neuroendocrine, you know, whatever. And they basically have to be functioning within certain parameters uh, for you to be functioning optimally. You know? Um, so this is kind of like that too. It applied on the level of the social. Uh, so, I think this is useful. I think, in other words, there's more to communist politics than nationalizing capitalist private property, um, capturing the state, at least initially, capturing the state, like Lenin says, right? The bourgeoisie cannot be in control of the state. We have to be. The bourgeoisie can join us, but they're no longer the bourgeoisie, right? These are all parts of politics. Right? But even more importantly for communist politics is this reconstitution of society into a more intelligent society. A, more, a society where people can actually are more fully developed on the level of human beings. Now, critics would say this is a humanist Marxism, which is bullshit. Like, you can have a critic's critique of this. Some, Mar some Marxists might say this is a Marxist humanism. Maybe Peter Bratzis would, would say that. <laughs> He's against humanist Marxism. I don't think this is humanist Marxism. I think this is simply uh, a Marxism that's infused with the entire uh, philosophical tradition of the Enlightenment, starting from, from, from basically Hegel, Spinoza, Hegel, and Kant, and then Marx. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's an important, from the Marxist point of view, although this could be read by liberals too, uh, I think a thoughtful liberal like Dewey would not disagree with this. This was Dewey's goal too. I mean, this is why he did all the educational reforms and the whole notion of progressive education in America. This was, Dewey would agree with this, that a well-functioning American society is, presupposes a fully developed public body. I would say too that like, in, in, you know, you kind of have to go through all the movements of Marx <clears throat> To get to the get to the sort of uh, anti-humanist Marx at the end of Marx, anyway, <laughs> right, right. you know, because his because his philosophy was really substantially based in practice and about liberation initially, you know, it was intimated by by those theories of, of liberation. So unless you really understand this, use it, apply it, I, I don't think you really get to the the complexity of maybe the the later anti-humanist Marx. That's true. That's absolutely true. And 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 and. And the whole notion of liberation, of course, means different things in different right. societies. Uh, in the case of Vilenkovs, I mean, you know, the Russian Empire was a very, in, very backward society, very unevenly developed. I think the literacy rate in Russia in 1917, depends on who you ask, but some of the statistics sure. I've seen, the literacy rate was like 10%, 12%. I mean, yeah, there was a basic literacy, mm -hmm. but there were in millions of people who were illiterate. So, uh, compared to America, for example, in 1917, America was actually, the United States was actually a very literate society compared to other, like, compared to France or compared to England, right, in the 19th century, um, far more than the Russian Empire. You know? and, it's, and, and, and to me, too, like, you know, if you get to this sort of uh, Marx that's just dispelling ideologies, uh, you know, with all these complex structures that, that I think, you know, maybe out there or someone in else In the would. Christian world, a Protestant, a country that's more Protestant than Catholic is always more literate because under Protestant Christianity, adherence is supposed to read the Bible, on and your under own. Under both Catholic and Orthodox uh, Christianity, they're supposed to listen to the priesthood. Right. right. And that one of the theories on why the Scotsman did much better in, in uh, creating industries and becoming wealthy in colonies than the English is that they were Presbyterians long before the Anglican Church became more Protestant and less Catholic. So that they were, they're more literate and more right. uh, accustomed to, to challenging ideas, which you did not under either Catholicism or Orthodoxy. You know, uh, I mean, the Martin Luther's revolution was definitely had to do. With, there's a great quote in um, 
Michael's teacher, Rainer Schurman, was this great German post-World War II philosopher who taught at the New School. And he wrote a huge book, which was basically his reading of philosophy in the uh, last 2,000 years. And in there, he, his name is Rainer Schurman. He succeeded the Hannah Arendt Chair of Philosophy at the New School. But Josh, don't forget your thought, because you were... I, I, so Rainer Schurman was a major <laughs> figure in post-World War II philosophy, including in New York City, kind of intellectual life. Um, died young of AIDS, unfortunately, at 57. But he did complete these two enormous books that are very important in French, translated to English, he wrote in French, never in German because of what happened in the war and he refused to. But he has incredible quotes from Martin Luther, where Luther basically says, the correct way to be a Christian or to be faithful is to, is to what was the quote? It's something like, is to understand what you do, to do by understanding. So that kind of a reform had to do with literacy as well. That the Protestant had to obey and live life by understanding, not just by obeying. So the obedience has to be processed by you. Obedience in your mind. has to be chosen, not enforced. Or chosen, yeah. yeah. Because you have to engage your sense-making apparatus. And that's the major break in Christianity, which is connected to the European Enlightenment also, right? In that sense, I, you know. I'll look, I'll look yeah, great, great writer. Yeah, very beautiful kind of thinking. Um, I think Sartre or Derrida, Derrida said, Derrida said about Schurman that his big book is the most significant book in philosophy since 1945. Hmm. Hmm. That's pretty good. But Josh, you were saying something about oh, what I, I guess maybe this is maybe just sort of a, redu a reductionistic kind of notion of uh, maybe of of, of that more complex Marxism, let's say, but you know how different is a liberation from a, you know dislocating ideology ultimately. You know what I mean? I think like uh, they're sort of relative terms to s s getting at the same notion ultimately. You know, uh, so I don't know how how far even the distinction is between an anti-humanist Marx and a humanist Marx, right. like what that really gained, what you gain in that anyway. Maybe know? like a superficial humanist Marxist critique of Yudenkov right. would be just this superficial kind of, yeah, right. reading of this. No, you're right. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, I mean, Marx, towards the end of his life, though, was, was dealing, you know, with Chinese writing capital, right? Yeah. So he's focused in on, yeah. uh, on the economic, yeah. And he kind of, you know, he wasn't writing as much about it. Politics, per se. Well, sure, yeah, but, but even uh, even still, like, you know, the, what, what's underneath all of that seems like yeah. it's still the... the but see, that's, this is an interesting tension in Marxist politics. I think that the next level is probably Lenin, because Lenin was all about the politics right. before 1917. So that he kind of filled in the gap of what maybe Marx moved away from in his writing explicitly because he was focused on understanding the economy right, right. and the English economists and, and the French economists and all that stuff. Yeah. Mao. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Of course, Lenin, I've had professors who are Marxists who completely disregard Lenin as a philosopher, which is, mm -hmm. it's laughable because he didn't write big books. Well, he didn't write big books because he was doing politics. He didn't have the time to sit in the library and, and, and write a fight, a, 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 a thousand lot of pamphlets. <laughs> a lot of pamphlets. Um, yeah. But he did study Hegel's yeah. logic very yeah. closely. Yeah. Yeah. When you're doing politics, you don't have a lot of time to write. You know, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you really don't. <laughs> <laughs> you really You know, I read this incredible quote by the American military attache to the Russian government in 1918, who was basically an intelligence officer. And his job was to report to President Wilson, you know, what this new Soviet Russian government was about and what was the quality of the, of the ministers, you know, the, of the... And he was either the ambassador or the military attaché, colonel something. Very smart guy. So he wrote an intelligence report evaluating the character and the personalities of the new Soviet government, 1918. And he has this incredible paragraph and he says, 
by virtue of languages spoken, books and pamphlets published, this is by far the most intelligent government that Europe has had since the French Revolution. This was the report to the president. And, and then he goes through the list, you know, Lenin speaks, you know, four languages, has written this, this you know, uh, Trotsky, you know, whatever, uh, Radek, you know, the Czech, this, this, and he goes through a laundry list of all the senior members of the government, and he says, these people are not a joke. The European, you know, monarchies are a joke in terms of their intellectual capacities. You know, the German, the Kaiser's government and the French government, you know, these people are a joke intellectually. No wonder that these people are doing what they're doing because there's a certain philosoph theoretical, there's praxis. There's a theoretical and empirical rigor. These people lived politics in a certain way that their opponents did not, you know, the Russian emperor or the, yeah, or the German Kaiser's government. Which was a Trumpian figure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there wasn't much compared to them. Hitler was a real move forward intellectually. Yeah. Compared to the German forward. Kaiser, the Nazi <laughs> movement was incredibly intellectually rigorous. I mean, that might sound crazy, but it's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, that includes Heidegger, you know? Heidegger was part of that movement. You know, um, so, okay, so let's get, so then the mind, you know, the next paragraph, page four, the mind, the, so what is the mind then? Again, these are, in other words, I think what Inaki is doing here, he's wrestling with difficult words and concepts that, that, that are hard to define. So in other words, what is intelligence? Right, so this is one area of concern. What is the relationship between the social and the individual? Or rather, the collective and the individual. In other words, this is not a simplistic argument in defense of the collective without the individual, but in other words, there's a relationship here that needs to be uh, made sense of in a way that's actually real, the way societies work. Then there's, the, there's, an, there's an attempt to define the mind. Like, what, do we, what happens in the mind and not the brain? Like, what, what is this kind of uh, metaphysical construct that makes us who we are? So the mind, the ability to think independently, this is Kant again, right? Takes, and Hegel, takes form and develops only, right? So there's an emphasis here, only, in the course of individual assimilation of the intellectual culture of an epoch. So in other words, we become humans with a developed mind only if we assimilate, right? Only if we assimilate or inherit, if you will, what he calls culture. In other words, you were born in the United States, you were born in New York City, so you're, you're, you're like an East Coaster, or, you know, you're a city person. You inherit the culture that New York City is and all of its different, and especially depending on your neighborhood and your family and whatever, but you have to understand that culture. You have to, you have to, you know, you know what I mean? Like you can't have a superficial engagement with it. You have to really understand the culture that you inherit before you can accept it or criticize it, you know, or both. And if you, uh, and if you understand the culture that you inherit by living it, by being exposed to it in school, at home, through your friends, through media, you know, all these different ways through which we socialize. Only then you begin to form your own intellectual potential because, because you understand what's happening to you. You understand where you come from, even if you reject it or even if you accept it. You know, this, there's an interesting parallel with this other book that I'm reading um, by the French thinker Stigler, you know, Stigler or however you say it, Stigler, who's very big now. And this is a book that's called Taking Care of Youth and the Generations. And it's exactly about this. What happens when the process of socialization by which we grow up and we live meaningful lives through inheriting, understanding, and making sense of the cultures that shape the society that we come into, when this transmission mechanism is interrupted, he says this has devastating results. We live life than only at the mercy of uh, lowest common denominator life. Marketing and automated behavior. Uh, simple consumption, simple 
uh, instinctive responses. You know, we don't live like humans. You know, we live like... This is very much the same argument that Ilenkov is interested in making, but this is expressed in a different language, like the language of Heidegger, Freud, you know, Kant, you know. Basically reading some of the same people, but um, I just can't read this stuff for too long. It drives me crazy, like his <laughs> horrible writing. <laughs> Stream of yeah. consciousness, kind of. I don't find Stiegler very. I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, he's a great thinker. He's a great thinker, but I think he needs a good editor to like rewrite a lot of the, you know, the. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. these are important sentences. The mind, the ability to think independently, takes form and develops only. So it's the only way possible for him in the course of individual assimilation of the intellectual culture of the epoch. So that's our individual task. At some point, it's an individual task. Properly speaking, the mind is nothing other than this intellectual culture transformed into a personal possession and legacy, into the principle of a person's activity. This is Soviet psychology also, the Vygotsky school, you know, cultural activity theory. We become who we are through this process of, uh, of uh, taking in the broad culture that that we live in, but then making sense of it individually. Whether we rebel against it, whether we accept it, but, but we are who our culture or what our dominant cultures are once we inherit. So in other words, part of the socialization process is this kind of like external, internal movement. Right? So in other words, I'm a child, I'm soaking in what's happening, I'm an adult, I'm, I've already soaked up a lot, and based on what I've soaked up and I understand, I can actually start to live my life uh, as a mature person, as a person who can make sense of, of their lives, because they already know the different forces that are shaped their society. But this learning process is a deeply personal one on a certain level. Right? It's the sort of like internal struggle that happens when you, when you realize that you are part of a culture or you, you absorbed certain practices, right? And then you rebel against this or you accept it, you know, whatever the case might be. This is a very important feedback mechanism. And then, of course, you throw it back because you are in this society, you are in this cultural space, which has many different components. And as you inherit it and you make sense of it, and it starts affecting who you are, you're also immediately contributing to it, you're feeding back into it, because you are consciously or unconsciously, but you're sort of... Are you calling that an internal factory? Ilenkov would call it, after Vygotsky, uh, he would call this uh, inner speech. Vygotsky, you know, the great Soviet psychologist in the 1930s and 20s, called this the process of inner speech, Interacting with external speech. Okay, thank you. In other words, um, they're all the same. It's almost like this flip coin. It's the same physical process. It's the same metaphysic. It's the same uh, material process of living life socially. But it has these different manifestations. The manifestation of your sort of inner, internal... Um, I don't know how you want to think about it. Like your internal... Uh, well, we go processing. Processing, uh, which of course changes when you interact with others, right? And then get, there's also the external uh, manifestations of a culture. It could be the dominant ideology. It could be, you know, whatever. But you make sense of that on your own. And, it, and, and then you act according to that making sense. If that process of making sense is interrupted or it doesn't exist... Kids are changing the hallway. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it's funny because you can see kid like little toddlers doing this, you know, like they're processing what's going on around them. Like they sit there and they babble. They, they, I watch this friend's kid and she's just constantly talking to herself, constantly, you know, and she's making sense of things. You know, it's like uh, 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 uh. <laughs> it's like she's inheriting all this stuff right, that's right. part of for her part of what 
world is and, and her right. world is, and then and it begins this kind of process. Yeah. It begins this, whether it's subconscious or unconscious, both. That doesn't matter so much for him. The point is that this process is very important. That's the heart of politics. Like, what gets internalized? What doesn't? Who decides? Who shapes social relations in a way that, you know, condition these things? Um, mind is made up of nothing else but this. To use the high-flown language of philosophy, it is the individualized spiritual wealth of society. So this is like a very Hegelian kind of uh, process. Uh, and, and this, to put it simply, means that mind, and by mind, of course, he means intelligence, talent, ability, etc., is the natural state of humans. The norm and not the exception. So, of course, this is Ilenkov sort of flipping. The normal result of development of a biologically normal brain under normal human condition. Uh, you know, Ilenkov's famous point, as you know later in the, argument, in the article, is that uh, human talent is not a state of exception. To say you're a really talented painter or you're a really ta talented dancer, uh, it's not that the exceptional few are talented in society. That's just a symptom of a society that's sick, that's not fully functioning normally. The point is everybody has talents that are different, at different levels. The point is the, if you have no talent <laughs> that you are aware of, that others are aware of, that means something happened where you did not famous American writer named Robert Service said, right. uh, no man is completely useless. He can always serve as a bad example for others. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so in other words, if somebody has no clearly identified talent, then that person, for whatever reason, or that group of people, for whatever reason, have not individualized the spiritual wealth of society. That's not necessarily their fault. That's not their fault. Well, see, that's the, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of where he's going he's gonna to bet his money, right? That the talent is a normal s sort of manifestation of a well-socialized human being. Lack of talent or clearly identified talent is, is basically not an individual fault. It, it's, not, it's less of an individual fault than a socialization problem, either by design or otherwise, or neglect or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, conversely, okay, I, I just to finish that sentence, last, next to last paragraph of page 21. Um, the norm and not the exception. The normal result of the development of a biologically normal brain. Okay. Conversely, the so-called stupid person, the person with a deficiency of powers of judgment, is above all a maimed person. This is, a, this is a, uh, somebody who's been subjected to, uh, what's the word? Mutilation. A person with a crippled brain, not biologically crippled brain though. I mean, if the brain is biologically crippled, then of course that's a different conversation. That person can never, you know, develop. You know, so he's not talking about people who have had a motorcycle accident and they've crippled their brain biologically. So a stupid person, the person, quote unquote, with a deficiency of powers of judgment is a, is a, is a person with a crippled brain. This cri so what causes the crippling? This crippling of the organ of thinking is always the consequence of abnormal and unnatural conditions, the result of a crudely coercive pedagogical influence. So in other words, he places that on the process of socialization. This is what cripples brains, not, not some kind of an inherently biological result. So this he's arguing against racists here which were also alive in the Soviet Union too, under the form of positivists. Mm -hmm. He's arguing about positivists, which for Ilyankov are racists, because they prioritize biological brain development as hard-coded, predetermining social development. And to him this makes no sense. Because he says, if somebody's born with a biologically damaged brain, we, that's fine, that's a different case. That's a different case, you know. Um, if somebody has the Zika virus as an unborn fetus and they're born missing 30% of their gray matter, well, that's a horrible roll of the dice for that kid. But that kid is, okay, that kid is going to have different cognitive abilities, ultimately different mind. But he's not talking about brains who are dam or underdeveloped, damaged that way biologically. He's looking at the average human baby born, you know. Look, it's like Aristotle in the politics. This is all paraphrase. Aristotle says, I'm talking about a typical human being 
born with a typical mind, typical brain. He says, for all other cases, you're either talking about gods or other beasts. You know? And I'm not going to talk about that, he says. The organ of thinking, again, um, in other words, how, how, how to cripple a mind. Like, how can somebody cripple a mind? The organ of thinking is much more easily crippled than any other organ of the human body. And it is very difficult after a certain age, quite impossible to mend. Now, maybe this is debatable, I don't know. To cripple it is simple. So how do we cripple human minds? To cripple it is simple. And, and the, his target is going to be uncreative, positivist teachers in the school system of his own society, right? So to cripple by means of a system of unnatural exercises. And one of the most reliable methods of crippling the brain and the intellect ultimately is the formal memorization of knowledge, which stands for learning. This is sort of like in the Soviet Union, there was a big debate in the 60s over pedagogy. Over right? what? Pedagogy. So how do you teach? And even today, if you talk to somebody who came out of the Soviet system of education, you're going to sort of experience this simply by talking to them. They either would have picked up the positive education or they would have picked up the, the sort of the type of education that Ilyankov was uh, supporting. Yeah, a friend of mine grew up in Moscow. He, uh, he said, you know, because he was looking at, I, I remember I brought, brought into uh, where we worked, you know, a copy of Capital. And it was the new Penguin. Yeah. You know, edition, and he was like, let me see. And he started looking through it. He said, there's more stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because he memorized it. Right. Mm. My mother, like she was a doctor, so she, she says, part, like I said something well, to- He was an engineer. So right, yeah. so college, so I said something to my mom, like, um, she's like, what are you doing? And I said, oh, we're reading, uh, you know, Hegel. She says, oh yeah, dialectical logic. And I was like, what? You, you've read dialectical? She says, of course, overcoming contradictions. And she, so she had like a mechanical answer to it, which was correct because she has photographic memory. Right. So she remembered the passages from Hegel's logic. But she said, how does that really actually play out in real life? I can't really apply it in real life because she didn't really... Right. But, but she was exposed to it, right? right. Yeah. Uh, but then, but then she, she when she had to talk about biology, like something about some biological process, she really had a really thinking, in-depth kind of response. Like she would be like, oh yeah, well, this is what happens when the virus attacks the body. So she had a very kind of philosophical and nuanced understanding of that instead of just a... Re but in philosophy proper, she had this like canned kind right. of response, like Hegel, overcoming of contradictions, right. you, know? <laughs> like, you know? So she got both sides, you know? Um, my experience was, I think, more on the Yudenkov, because I went to music school, and we had a system in Bulgaria where every kid in junior high school, you kind of had to subscribe to three different types of journals, like uh, magazines. So one was a literature magazine, like short stories and, and fiction. The other one was like a hard science magazine, so you could choose like, kind of like a popular mechanics kind of a thing, but that was like physics, biology, and you had to choose one from a list that was um, like, lot, like, like social sciences, like philosophy, you know, so you read like Descartes, you know, mind-body duality, and so you pick like, so I would pick like a math journal for like seventh graders, and like a philosophy journal, and a poetry journal, and you would get these every, <laughs> every month, at home, like these journals would arrive. Mm. And the point was you were supposed to read this stuff in addition to your schoolwork. Mm. And some people read it and some kids didn't, but all my friends read that stuff. So I read it too, because I didn't want to be like the idiot who didn't read it. And I was interested in it. So I remember we had to read about the space shuttle that the Americans had made, you know, like what is the space shuttle? And you know, I remember vividly reading articles about the tiles on the outside of the space shuttle that were heat resistant. And that allowed the space shuttle to to land like an airplane. I mean, the space shuttle was a big deal, you know, in the <laughs> 70s, you know, in the early 80s. And so, so you got both of that, you know. Of course, you have that in the United States too. You have popular mechanics for juniors, right? I mean, you have all that stuff here. But over there, it was systematic. It was part of the education system, you know. And it wasn't just like, you know, if you wanted it or if you had that kind of a teacher. Or if you had a different kind of a teacher, you would read 
only the maths journal or you know what I mean like so so he would um, so the formula memorization, it is precisely by this method that stupid people are produced. That is, so what is a stupid person? Again, this is again, in other words, this is in society. People use these words, you're stupid or you're smart. But what does that mean in a more kind of nuanced and thinking way? So what is stupid? Well, for him, it's a people with an atrophy. It's a very interesting definition. People with an atrophied power of judgment. That's all. There's nothing derogatory to this term. It's just an atrophied powers of judgment. Very Kantian definition, but also very useful, I think. So if, if I'm not functioning on all cylinders in my mind, it's not that I can't do it. It's just that I have an atrophied abilities, powers of judgment. Now that could be changed up to a point, right? Uh, but that's what we need to watch out for, you know. Uh, people who are unable to competently to relate the general knowledge they have mastered to reality and who therefore make a mess of things. People who are unable to competently relate the general knowledge they have mastered to the reality that they are part of. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, then we can, there's a great description of schooling on page 13 which follows right now, right? It's a great, where he says, you know, cramming backed by endless repetition, which should be called not the mother, but rather the stepmother of learning. It's a great passage. Cripples the brain and the intellect. Paradoxically enough, the truer and cleverer the truths inculcated by cramming, the more crippling the effect. The point is that a stupid and a nonsensical idea from a child's own head will soon be dispelled by experience. Right? Kids learn something in school and they're like, that's not how the real world works, and then they don't take school seriously. When such an idea clashes with facts, the child will be forced to doubt, to compare, to ask why, and in general to rack his brains. An absolute truth, by contrast, will never give him occasion to do those things. Um, it is for this reason that an absolute truth, crammed without understanding, becomes for the brain something like a track for a train or blinkers for a workhorse. The brain grows accustomed to move only along a beaten track by other brains. Anything that lies to the right or left of those track is no longer of interest to it. It simply no longer pays attention to other things, regarding them as inessential and uninteresting. You know, like I've had so many colleagues in academia who say, can you explain to me your thesis in three sentences or less? <laughs> and I'm like, I can't. And they're like, well, you haven't thought about it hard enough. And I'm like, that's true. Or maybe it takes more than three sentences to explain the damn thing. In other words, the, the, if you have this formula, like explain to me a, 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 an argument in three sentences or less, or, or why, don't, why don't you allow six sentences? Just allow it. You know, see what happens, right? Yeah. This is a person who doesn't know how to think. Yeah. They just can't do it. They, they have a formula of what it means to have a good argument, has to be succinct, has to be three sentences or less, you know. Yeah. Who is that? Un, you know, unnamed professor of sociology, for example, that I work with. You know, Heidegger spent 37 pages justifying how, the question that he's going to ask in being in time. 37 pages just to explain to himself and to the readers why he's asking that question. If Heidegger can do it or if you know, do we can do it or whatever, why can't we do it? Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's funny. I think that they've dumbed down education in the United States. The question is why? Why do it? Well, because I, well, when I was in um, college, the, you know, basically they, there were two books that came out at that time in the 70s. Um, one was The Crisis of Democracy that uh, Samuel P. Huntington right. wrote about how the problem in the United States was there was too much democracy right. and the people had to, there were, we, I mean he actually said we have to restore apathy. And, um, Do you um, think this also gels with uh, the Business Roundtable report, uh, which is an incredible document, document round table? Um, well, there was also a Carnegie Commission 
uh, report on education that came out about the same time. And it was that we were, American education, the reason why people were demanding more democracy is because the, t the schools were teaching liberal arts and that really what they needed to be teaching was business and the things that were useful to, you know, the corporate elites. So maybe this was the beginning point of the socialization of cybernetics, which was becoming accepted on the highest levels of university planning committees or government and whatnot. And the total movement away from like a Deweyan vision of progressive education in America, which was influential in a certain stage, right? Earlier yeah. in the century. Yeah, it was funny, I, I just, I looked at a, when I was in high school, I had to read this book. Well, I didn't have to read the whole thing, but we, we would, I had a teacher who would discuss stuff like law and yeah. uh, what, what all that. I mean, he was ideologically very liberal, you know, uh, and kind of. So Locke was one of the major figures. Yeah. For, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but he also had us read this book called The American Pageant, which was, you know, a total, uh, propagating the peace, you know, <laughs> on how great the U.S. system was. But it was, it was developed, you know, it was a developed argument. It was well done, yeah. Right. Yeah. And they now print that book still, but it's, they took away, Bailey was the guy who wrote it in back in the 1950s. And now it's, now they've taken his name off it. And it's, Skinnier. They've removed stuff to make yeah, it easier. Yeah, they've just taken stuff yeah. out, you know? Yeah. So it's not, it's just a very rigid, uh, you Exactly, know. like mechan mechanistic kind of presentation of yeah. ideas. Yeah. yeah, but it's, you know, but it's the same book. It's got the same title, but the author's different. Right. <laughs> I think the more we think about this, I know we're moving slowly, but I mean... Yeah, sorry. No, 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 but this is very important. The more we think about Ilenkov's point here about this kind of inheritance of accumulated cultural sort of... Uh, what is the phrase, the Hegelian phrase, the, the inheritance of... Um, um, the individualizing... The, the, the acquisition of individualized spiritual wealth of society. Uh, this is what a totally digitized uh, society cannot do because cybernetics as a philosophy cannot make sense of this. This is where, in this process, where the internalization of a culture becomes possible over time, of course, this is where, this is a very complicated and messy process, this is where contradictions emerge, this is where misunderstandings happen, this is where emotional, affective energies are deployed by the person who's internalizing the social, this kind of wealth, materialized wealth of society. This is where thinking emerges, which is thinking, which is, yes, it's not linear, it's not, first of all, it's not causal, it's not only and simply causal or unidirectional, like some, some kind of a computer networking graph, right? This is, and it's certainly not linear, Although it can be, it can be any of these things. But it could be interrupted. It could reach a dead end. It could completely reverse itself into not A. Right? So in other words, this is what Hegel understood. Well, Aristotle understood this too, but this is what Hegel understood in his studies of what logic is, which is sort of a strictly careful uh, ways of understanding what thinking is on the most profound and thus most useful level of, human, of being human, right? It's, it's right here, in this process, sort of where, where contradictions, the need to say no to something, negation emerges, right? To say, I don't want this anymore. I'm not gonna be this anymore, or I'm not gonna do this anymore. In other words, how can you hire engineers who are not good at math, right? And if you say, well, I'm gonna be the, the, the uh, manager of, of an engineering company, I'm not going to put up with this nonsense anymore. I'm going to elevate my standards of recruitment where I'm going to only hire engineers who are at a certain level. 
And if the schools are not producing that, well, then I'm going to mobilize a conversation that deals with curriculum design. You know, just to give a, an example from the point of view of a general electric or something, right? The solution is not to buy engineers ready-made from other countries. That's a dumb solution. That's a positive. That's what a computer would do. Give me an available pool of resources that I can use that meet certain requirements, right? That I can input into a process that well, produces an output. Exactly. Even better. Yeah. Right. So I'm just going to sort of it's 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 sort of an act. I'm going to acquire this data point, which has particular properties x y z, and I'm going to input this data point, which is going to produce a particular output, and then I'm done. That's not human. That's not how humans function best. And that's not how we do our best work. So, so the contradiction, negation, in other words, human logic, which has to be dialectical. It has to be able to engage in negation and thus the negation of the negation itself as something that's completely organic. This is what enables the internalization of the materialized wealth of society to happen. Otherwise, you're just memorizing stuff that others told you to memorize, but you can't really act that way because that makes no sense to you. So you're just going to forget it as soon as you test it. Or you're going to be like, I, what I just memorized, I don't understand, so I'm not going to use it. It's meaningless to me. So the need to think logically this way, uh, in this messy way that Hegel is trying to describe uh, through contradictions, is very practically grounded. It's grounded in the way humans make sense of life. <laughs> By internalizing the inherited, the, the previously existing cultural formations that they're born into, that they're growing up in. So the need to study dialectic, the need to study logic dialectically is grounded not in an intellectual quest to learn how to think rigorously. It's grounded in the need to live life as fully as possible. That can mean many different things, right? But you can't live life fully because you will never be able to understand the society that produced you, for better or worse, if you do not know how to, what is the famous Hegelian quote? To, to, to mar I use marinate, but he says to, to be able to persist in the tensions of a contradictory moment. If you do not know how to marry, if you're too easily insulted, if you're too easily stressed, I mean, these are just surface manifestations. If you're too, easy, if you're too fragile, if your psyche is too fragile, these are the markers of an underdeveloped human being, of a crippled human being. To say, I'm hurt, and then give up, is the mark of a fragile human being. Fragility is a byproduct of crippled, what Yelenkov would say, a crippled uh, intellect. Well-adjusted people, well-developed people, which anybody can be in their own terms, have resilience, have curiosity, have, um, they have the capacity to tell stories, right? They have the, because they've acquired that, 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 that skill by listening to other people tell them stories. Storytelling, right? Um, I mean, you can apply these all the, all, uh, on all different levels. They have varied interests. They care about sports. They read books, but they also enjoy dancing. They write, so this is the, this is the communist citizen in Ilyenkov's language. I mean, we can apply this to other political ideologies too. Maybe, I mean, like I said, Dewey would agree with this. Dewey would have no problems with these descriptions, right? In, in, in sort of the Dewey and uh, requirements for a democratic society, for example. So, uh, before you go on to another major point, a minor point in the next paragraph that I did not understand. Mm. What is grafting? Let's do it. Page, uh, so you're on page 13, uh, the first paragraph? No, Second it, paragraph. my next paragraph. Everyone knows what an agonizing experience this crudely coercive operation on the brain Cramming right. and grafting. grafting. Okay. Now, I know cramming, fine, but what's grafting? So, in other words, if this circle represents our mind, the brain, you know, the, the, the physiochemical uh, stuff that enables the mind to form memories and, 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 and to think and all that stuff, which is metaphysical, there's no doubt about it. It's metaphysical in the sense that 
You cannot yeah. study it with a CAT scan. You just can't do it. You have to invent new physical principles to capture this stuff. So he's saying if you just force, if you engage the, the part of the brain that can do memorization, right? If you, if you define learning as memorization, then what happens is it's a process of grafting. You are taking something that exists in somebody else's mind as a, as a set of ideas, the teacher, for example, or the ad for Apple, or some podcast that you listen to because you really believe that this person has the truth. So the grafting process is essentially simple mechanistic memorization of what others tell you. So it's literally, this is something that can be described through the language of computer programming or cybernetics. So you have this some kind of a process where, you know, uh, data structure X, which could be called the American dream, or it could be called how to live life well, or it could be called what shall I eat for dinner to be healthy. You take something that is a ready-made idea. So it's, it's, a, it's not a technical term. It's no. taking like grafting from a tree and right. then... Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's metaphorical deployment. It's, yeah, although it's, it's, you're very careful readers always. You can almost imagine 20 years from now uh, uh, bioengineering where they might graft, right, something in your brain that will force you. They're already close. Right. <laughs> they're already close. It's not 20 years away. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you're right. So this is a dual, in our time, this is a dual meaning. It could be a literal technique for, yeah. Yeah. I mean, human cloning, who knows? Maybe they've already know how to create humans through cloning of genetic human embryo material with specific brain areas of the brain that, that, that do function and other brains that have been areas that are attenuated. If you That's horrible, graft, but it could If happen. you can graft one heart from a body into another, it's not difficult to believe that one brain can be. But here is the tragedy of those people who are doing this, unless they're philosophically on this level. If they're simple positivists, and they think that they can reduce human thought to biological grafting of DNA material, they're going to be in for a big surprise because the human psyche develops through the inheriting of social structures, right? And if they do not understand that, they can create crippled human slaves who will only be capable of certain narrow human-like subset, but they're no longer human at that point. But that's what they want. Well, they're not humans at that point. They're just cyborgs. They're different species. Yeah. Well, they are creating different. They are creating different That's already species. done by society. Right. And, 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 and that's when I think the new politics of racism will be real and much sure. more dangerous. Wait, wait. Explain that to me again. The moment we graft or we create clones of humans that are biologically different enough in the brain, we're going to create a real politics of human races, where there will be races that are biologically differentiated enough for the word race to actually make sense biologically. And that could be something that's terrifying, if they use it in that way. So are you bothering you? Right. right. There's a great novel already, among many others, by a Japanese-English writer who got the Nobel Prize recently by the name of uh, Ishiguro. I forget the name of the novel. They made a movie about it. It's about high school kids who are in a boarding school in England, and they can only leave the boarding school on Sunday like, like a, for leave to visit the town. And one of them comes home one day terrified because she saw her twin. Yeah. But they're like, maybe I didn't really see my twin. Maybe I just thought she was my twin. But, and none, none of them, they're all orphans. They don't know their parents. So in other words, eventually they find out that they're clones. Uh, and the, their sole purpose of life is they're basically harvesting their organs for harvest. They're carriers of organs to be harvested by the original versions. So when somebody gets old and they need a new heart, they're going to basically go and kill this, their, their clone, take their heart because it's going to be genetically very close to them. Their own body will not reject it. And, and, you know, but they live a very comfortable life as in an elite boarding school, you know, 
They're well taken care of, they're very well educated, uh, but they're simply repositories for other people's organs. In a perfectly democratic, liberal democracy, you know, England, you know, it's not like some dystopian dictatorship with drones and whatever, it's just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure that's a good description of England when they elect Boris Johnson. Yeah. Maybe he is a drone. Or, um, so, Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, and so we can just, so the next paragraph then, um, so then the next paragraph is very interesting then because he gets into this discussion of memory and the, the important concept of active memory and how that connects to learning. You know, this really, the more I think about this essay, it's almost like you throw in the kitchen sink. It's really not only about dialectical logic, technically speaking. It's more about everything that, that it takes to kind of make sense of what Hegel was starting to do and Marx was trying to do. Like, what does it mean to think dialectically? Well, it's to engage active memory, to have a well-developed active memory practices that are part of your habit of, of, of living, of everyday life. So, as numerous experiences have proved, there is an empirical aspect to Yudankov and all the best of the Soviet philosophers. They're all, they were grounded uh, in, in, in these kinds of quantitative aspects as well. As numerous experiments have proved, man's quote-unquote memory stores everything that has been of concern to its possessor throughout life. However, some knowledge is stored in the brain, so to speak, in an active state, with an easy recall or reach and in case of need, can always be called into the light of consciousness by an effort of the will. You know, I, I was thinking about the sentence, this, which is again deceptively easy and clear. And I was just thinking, think about Nietzsche, you know, like the will to power. And it's like, it sounds very uncomfortable or it kind of, I don't know, the will to power maybe. You know? But maybe it's not so uncomfortable. Maybe Nietzsche, Nietzsche's will to power simply, simply means, uh, on one level, uh, the ability to have this effort, to be able to do this effort of recalling something that you know into your immediate consciousness. Maybe that's, that's an example of the will that doesn't sound very, uh, you know, uh, esoteric or proto-fascist or whatever. You know, I mean, Nietzsche was cool, you know? You could, there are many different ways we can read Nietzsche, you know? And, and um, this is knowledge that it's is... It's more entertaining to read than, say, Heidegger. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, the language is kind of beautiful in, in that other way, right? Yeah. This is knowledge that is closely connected with the sense and object-oriented life activity of man. I think we have to clarify this a little bit because when you hear the word object-oriented, we immediately might think about cyber computer programming, object-oriented programming. But in Soviet uh, uh, cultural uh, activity theory and psychology, this has a specific meaning that, that um, active knowledge is immediately grounded to sort of the sense making of the world that we have as humans. You know, make sense of the world. Some stuff happens to you. you your senses capture it. Then what, right? Well, the, the world is materialist. It's object filled, right? And we are sort of navigating life. Uh, there is no, this is not a the Cartesian sort of mind body duality philosophy. This is more like a. Aristotelian Spinoza's philosophy that that we are nature and nature is us. There's no separation, you know, uh, in in in, in Ilyankov's. This active memory is reminiscent of a well-organized workplace, in which the crafts. You know, Ilyankov's analogies I think are very beautiful and very helpful. This active memory is reminiscent of a well-organized workspace in which the craftsman takes hold of the object the instrument or material he needs without a glance and without specially recalling which muscle he has to move for his purpose. Think about Heidegger's discussion of the, of the, of the hammer and the tool here as well. Sort of, it's kind of an interesting, it's like a similar orbit, I think. Um, it is quite another matter with knowledge that the brain has absorbed in complete isolation from its main activity and placed, so to speak, in reserve. In other words, there's two different ways to learn, quote unquote. If you learn mechanistically by memorizing stuff, yes, that stuff goes into your mind, but the mind basically is like, I don't know what to do with this stuff. There's no obvious engagement in everyday life with this stuff. I can't really relate it to 
my culture or my, my friends or what I do at work. So I'm just going to file it away because I need to get an A on the test. So I'm just going to remember it. But as soon as the test is over, you're going to forget it. Right? So he's trying to distinguish between two ways through which our memory is activated. Right? So the memory is a building block in sort of learning how to think or thinking. But there are two ways, at least, at least two ways through which to affect memory, right? Or to, to memorize something, actively or, or he might say passively, right? He's not saying passively, but I'm saying passively. One is more desirable than the yeah, other. Yeah, he might say intentionally and unintentionally. Or an intent, you're right, right. French psychologists, for example, applied special techniques to the brain of an old semi-literate woman to force her to declaim for hours and end ancient Greek verses, Jeez, this sounds like torture, of which she understood neither the content nor the meaning, and that she recalled only because once, many years before, some diligent high school, you know, gymnasium student had memorized these verses aloud in her presence. In the same way, a stonemason recalled an accurately drawn paper, the fantastically intricate twists and bends of a crack in a wall that he had once had to repair. In order to recall things of this kind, a person has to make agonizing exertions, and these very rarely succeeded. So what's the problem? The problem is that the brain submerges an enormous amount of unneeded, useless, and non-operational information in special dark storerooms below the threshold of consciousness. I like this phrase also, below the threshold of consciousness. Everything that a person has seen or heard at least once is stored there. In special abnormal cases, all the junk that is accumulated in these storerooms over many years breaks through to the surface of the higher region of the cerebral cortex into the light of consciousness. Then this person suddenly recalls a mass of trivial details that had apparently been long and finally forgotten. Here's the interesting part that's coming up though, on forgetting, right? I think it's very interesting. But this occurs precisely when the brain is in a state of passivity, usually that of a hypnotic trance as an experience of the French psychologist, which he doesn't cite. He's like, come on, man, I just cited. But you know, this, was, this article was not for an academic audience. This was written for a, a kind of a general uh, audience, which also gives you an, an, an this journal was, was, uh, was read by like 25 million people. So this gives you a general sense of the general level of, 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 of literacy and cultural development in the late 60s that that society had, that people would read this stuff. Uh, millions of people. In yeah. Russia. In Russia, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Masha Gessen was uh, a uh, editor of a scientific journal in, in Russia. Yeah. And said that it was the most... Uh, it was the most literate society yeah. in the 20th well, she, And she said it was the most popular. Like yeah. it, it sold more copies than anything else. Because... Everything else, everybody knew was bullshit. Right. <laughs> so people, they don't want the propaganda, right? Nobody right. read the propaganda nonsense, right. the Pravda, right. you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but even now, they did a study uh, of Russian reading habits, the, the comparison of reading habits around the world, like book buying and book reading and all this stuff. And even Russia, in its contemporary kind of devastated state, had twice the readership per, per, uh, per capita of Germany. And Germany had twice of like, you know, whatever, Greece or the United States was again like 14 or 15 or, you know. So, or 37. Or 37. Even though books are so easily available and, and relatively affordable, right? Very affordable actually, books. You can buy used books, you can buy, you know. Yeah. You can buy Marx probably or Hegel for $2 probably on Amazon as a used copy. Or and a, and a reader now it's cheaper than a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Or buying it from an academic press. So okay. Well, the academic presses are, of course. Yeah. They're still the elitist kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the point is that forgetting is not a defect. I think this is an important point. Quite the, the reverse. Forgetting is produced by special wise mechanisms of the brain that protect the organ of thinking the region of active brain function from drowning in unnecessary bullshit, basically, information. And by the way, the word information he puts in quotes because Ilenkov was involved in a long-running polemic throughout his entire life with kind of very prominent Soviet uh, cyber, uh, computer scientists and logicians. Uh, they went back and forth. Um, 
At the same time, he was very close friends with very famous Soviet mathematicians who were um, philosophically inclined. Like they were not just interested in solving math problems because they were cute and fun, but because they, they connected that to, the, to like the meaning of life itself. And he had these letters with uh, one person by the name of, uh, he's translated in English. If you, like, uh, if you study calculus or higher analysis, one of the prominent mathematicians of the 60s and 70s was by the name of Shilov. And I, I have his book in English on um, introduction to analysis. So Shilov was a famous, not like the, the first rate math, Soviet mathematician, but like very close, very famous. Um, and he had a series of letters with Ilenkov where they debate things like on the contradiction, on the notion of contradictions, and on, the, on, the, on what is thinking. You know, so and they have these kinds of uh, back and forth. Uh, another interesting example, if you're interested in sort of the best example of a Soviet uh, mathematician who is deeply anti positivist and he regularly criticized contemporary math professors and contemporary physicists and computer scientists for being essentially intellectual cripples because they, they have a wrong way of approaching thinking about mathematical problems, which is just an extension of, of thinking itself, right? Uh, there's a great, and this person was one of the great ma greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. His last name is Arnold. He died in 2014. He died very recently, 2011, Arnold. Um, first name I forget, Vladimir maybe. He was a Soviet, uh, a cat academician. It's basically like a distinguished professor. You know? A R N A R N O L D. Arnold was his last name. Um, he has many YouTube videos, including in English. He taught at the University of Paris since the Soviets fell apart. He taught in Moscow, Paris, and the United States, I think. But um, and what was his first name? I think it's Vladimir, Vladimir, like Putin, but <laughs> Vladimir Arnold. Uh, great thinker, because you see this kind of Ilenkovian approach to, to, to philosophy in the Soviet Union where you have a mathematician of the highest order who constantly reads literature and constantly studies, you know, Descartes and Galileo, like he spent his whole life reading and rereading Galileo's notebooks, you know, as sort of like the, the starting point of like modernity in terms of thinking and, and then he studied Spinoza and he read Descartes but constantly while he was doing math, right? Because there was an interesting interest in understanding the mysteries of how do we think, you know? Beyond the simple stuff of mechanistically remembering or memorizing algorithms of how to solve integrals or, you know, you know so on and so forth, which is important, but it's trivial. That's trivial. He never thought of reading Galileo. It never occurred to me. Galileo's notebooks and also Copernicus or something. I think maybe maybe he knew how to read Polish. Well, I have read a little Copernicus in English, not. Yeah. But these were monsters. I mean, Galileo studied everything, right? I mean, they didn't just do science, kind of like modern scientists. Or another great example, I think, of what Ilenkov is highlighting here in terms of uh, active thinking and active um, and its connection to actually uh, learning uh, to use your brain to the fullest potential is Richard Feynman, you know, the great American physicist. You know, there's a great video of Feynman from the 80s where, at the, towards the end of his life, where the journalist asks him about, like, what does it mean to ask a question? Like, how do you approach asking questions about physics and whatever? And Feynman has this incredible, because Feynman was a, you know, was a dialectic, dialectical thinker. I mean, he was a Marxist, he was a, he read, he read Hegel. He, read, he what? He was Italian, wasn't he? He was, he was Jewish. So Russian Jew, Brooklyn, second generation mm -hmm. immigrants, Feynman. Um, uh, you know, Feynman, you know, as he was a genius physicist, prodigy, worked in the Manhattan Project as a young man in his 20s, uh, uh, got the Nobel Prize for the Feynman, di Feynman diagrams in quantum uh, uh, mechanics. Um, describing particle movements, chaotic particle movements, major figures. So they asked Feynman, 
what does it mean to ask a question? And he said, well, that's a difficult thing to say, to, to explain. He says, well, think about it. He says, suppose I want to ask you a question. Suppose I want to know, what is ice? And he's like, an average person will tell me, who's not a physicist, will tell me, well, that's what happens when water freezes. And it's very slippery. And then he's like, okay, that's one answer. But he says, well, what does it mean for something, what is to freeze? Well, I don't know. It's when water gets really cold. Okay, well, then you dig to the level deeper than that. He says, well, when water molecules, you know, they, you know, something happens to the movement of the molecules and it slows down. And, you know, so then he goes through this 15 minute description of what is how ice forms in like four or five different ways. And the journalist is getting bored and annoyed because he wants the simple answer to the question, what is ice? Or, or how do we ask questions and how do we get answers directly and clearly, right? And Feynman's saying, there is no clear way to get answers. There's just a clear method. And the clear method has to do with these kinds of step-by-step, -step, it's, it's very Heideggerian, very Hegelian, very Marxist. It's you confront the problem. Like, you're studying ice, <laughs> you know? Like, what can you make of that? Well, maybe you develop a Microsoft, Microsoft <laughs> Microprose. That's another software. Microprose was a 1990s video game. You know. So you, you do a microscope and, you, and you're like, why would you invent a microscope to study ice? Well, maybe because you're not satisfied with the explanation that it's just water freezing. Maybe there's some, right? So, but then you encounter all kinds of contradictions. Well, what happens when... This is what Ilenkov is saying. This is what every human being is capable of doing. And if, to the extent that they don't do it, that's a function of, politi of politics, right? That's a, that's a, that's a political. Okay. Um, anyway, so we have to speed up. But uh, very quickly on page 15, uh, he has this incredible section on, on forgetting. Forgetting as a erasure of, of, of accumulated memories that are useless, okay? It's sort of the body's self-defense mechanism. Um, so mechanical memory is determined, um, is, so mechanical memory is detrimental actually for the uh, mechanism in the brain that is responsible for forgetting. So in other words, actively forgetting something is just as important as actively remembering something. It's part of the garbage collection of the mind. The problem with mechanical memory is that it interferes with our ability to forget stuff that needs to be forgotten. You see, uh, Stiegler makes this point in his own way here in this book when he says, what is the damage of when advertising of simple commodity products, ketchup, you know, whatever, takes center stage in your culture? when you become saturated with the cheapest type of advertising, is it's basically that our mechanical memory becomes activated, right? We're watching a movie, we're into it, and all of a sudden we get interrupted by a ketchup ad, right? That mechanical memory gets activated, now, now we, we get hit with this stupid image of ketchup, <laughs> which has nothing to do with the movie that you're watching, but then you can't forget easily about that ketchup ad advert afterwards because it keeps happening. Next, you're going to see it again in 15 minutes. And then you're going to take the train and you're going to see a version of the, of the ketchup ad on the train too. So, so mechanical memory, memorization, starts to interfere with our ability to forget. Yeah, well, like, oh. the thing that we remember is the jingles from commercials. Exactly. Wait, I'm so sorry. Say that again. The thing that we remember forever, or at least I do, <laughs> is the stupid jingles from commercials. I can, I can sing to you the Adventure Car Hop jingle <laughs> from my childhood. <laughs> so in other words, I mean, we can of course, I was thinking about this, this is an interesting insight. I mean, he, now he's getting into more like cognitive science research, which he was totally familiar with, because his best friends were the most important and interesting Soviet psychologists, you know, at the time. So he's getting into sort of paraphrasing state-of-the-art 19, late 60s cognitive science research, which of course, this needs to be updated or whatever, but which we can do. But the point is, that's another way of paying attention to, to, to what he's doing, is that we need to be aware of what cognitive science is, is feeding us, 
but with a, with with a critical lens, you know, because because it, it it might tell us something useful about sort of impressions and 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 how what happens what happens when we um, when we get bombarded with advertising. You're going to study this indirectly, of course. You're not going to do a CT scan. I mean, you can do it, but that's not going to be useful. But we can do qualitative research that might give us uh, an insights. But he thinks mechanical memory interrupts the optimal functioning of, the, of our mind's forgetting mechanism or forgetfulness mechanism, which is important, right, in order to keep us um, all the other aspects of, for example, attention, uh, the ability to focus, um, fantasy, right? That's very interesting, I think, to, to, to... The brain tries to forget what is useless or traumatic. I mean, you can take it down Freud as well. Or what is not connected with active thinking, to sink it to the bottom of the subconscious in order to leave the conscious free and ready for higher forms of activity. Now, this could be debatable if we are Freudians or Lac Lacanians, and maybe Ilyakov is not deploying insights from Freud and Lacan in a certain way. I don't know because I don't know Lacan at all. Uh, so I'm going to leave that as a question mark. But, um, but, but I think it's a very sophisticated hypothesis, if you will, or something to think about. Whether this interaction of... I mean, look, we, we, have, we have finite energy that's activated when we think. I mean, yeah, we go to sleep. We process stuff when we sleep, of course. But, but there is something that happens here on the level of the subconscious or the unconscious and the conscious, or however we want to phrase that, uh, that is a battle, that is a struggle. There's, there's a struggle here that happens on the level of, to use the language of, of our time, information overload or information processing. You know, there are books written about how contemporary capitalism interferes with our sleeping pattern. Right? That the gig economy, or uh, when you're on call 24 7, or when you're bombarded with social media 24 7, or when you're watching a screen 10 minutes before you go to bed, how that affects your overall ability to sleep, and how the interruption, interrupted sleep cycles are starting to affect our attention cycles. Or when reading something online, or by, when, when you or kid, and you, you become socialized on Twitter and Instagram, and you communicate through small, intense streams of barely comprehensible um, um, uh, communication, how does that affect your ability to parse temporarily very long-running ideas, like a book that's going to take you five years to digest? It just becomes impossible. That's what really impossible. Been researched. You know that. Yeah, that's been researched. That's already been demonstrated. Yeah. I mean, think about it. What can you possibly express in 140 character streams? If that's your primary way, Twitter is your primary way, or Instagram, which is a visual, uh, essentially iconography, infantilization, infants at, 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 at a stage in their adult uh, childhood development before they can comprehend letters are purely in the pictorial realm. So infantilization of adults, which were supposed to be mature, as the primary mode of communication combined with 140 character streams, what kind of cognitive, affective, and in otherwise intellectual sophistication or layering are you gonna be able to transmit through 140 character streams of, of communication? Not much. It's a hell of an experiment going on now. Mm -hmm. it dehumanization. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. You can't help but think this is done on purpose. I, I, the more I think about it, I don't know. Maybe I believe in, in too I much of it. So. But maybe I, not. Maybe it's just spontaneous kind of... Wait, say that again. Like, why, why isn't it a greater social political rebellion against this infantilization that's happening through social media technologies, the way they're done now, with Twitter and Instagram? and The latest one is something called TikTok. You know what TikTok is? Mm -hmm. It's a video service where it's a crippled... Go back and read Dostoevsky's The Grand Inquisition. Well, that's true, too. That's the answer right there. And and then, and this... Well, I'm going to shut up. Never mind. No, I mean, these are... In some ways, this is nothing new, what we're, we're living through, right? But there's an intensification of it, I think, that's new. You know, the socialization of cybernetics, I think, is something that... Well, question to be. is always... But I think also it, it sort of... Uh, it, 
I think not so much the, the technology itself. Is, right. is, yeah, technology is just... Yeah, but the, uh, but the fact that it occupies, the, that the way it's uh, um, presented is, is available, it's totally available all the time. Right. Yes. Totally. Um, but the other stuff, like more, you know, deeper thinking, all of that stuff, is totally unavailable. It's totally unavailable. Because of that other thing is totally in your face and it's occupying your... Uh, sure, yeah. You know, the Ilenkov had a great... We have to, I guess it's 8.30, but Ilenkov had a great... I'll, I'll upload this uh, book that he wrote. It's a booklet. It's a, it's a sci-fi, fictionalized uh, short story where uh, uh, two cyborgs or computer creatures, artificial intelligences, are having a crisis because they've in encountered a situation where there's a contradiction and they can't deal with it. So they ask a supercomputer, who's like the, the godlike thing. Anyways, so in, as part of that short story, which was recently translated to English, Ilenkov has a great definition of technology. He says te technology is not some kind of a neutral medium. That's just a natural thing. Technology simply reflects existing social relations and ideas. So the technology that exists today in the United States is what it, it simply replicates and mirrors social relations. In other words, this computer can be used completely differently if, sure. if the intention behind the software is different. Yeah. You know? So it's not the technology, it's not the circuit's fault, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or it's it's the it's the intentionality, it's the yeah. it's the Although use in some ways it is. I mean, but it is, right. Yeah, and the because level the choice is it is it's all binary, you know. I mean right. uh, Because yeah. it can't be any other any other way so far, right? It has to be binary or well they're trying to develop they, there are circuits that aren't binary. Okay. You know? So it's so it's already, circuits. Right. It's already possible to yeah. yeah, to do more. Yeah. So okay. So let's continue with this too a little bit next time. Let's start reading the Hegel as well. Okay. Then you know. You didn't yeah. even get to the interesting part. We're gonna do it next time. We're gonna dive you right in. You didn't even get to those interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You mean the 